Welcome everyone to this new episode of our podcast, The Next Page. I am super thrilled today because I have Adam Day coming back to our studio today to go deeper into a discussion that we had in May last year talking about the HLAB report, the report on the future of multilateralism leading to the summit of the future. So I really suggest you go back to that episode in May before you listen to this one. We're going to have two episodes with Adam, and I would like to thank him for that because we want to take you deeper into the six fundamental and transformative shifts for a more secure and sustainable future that were highlighted in the report, A Breakthrough for People and Planet, that was issued by the high-level advisory body on effective multilateralism. So this is a huge report and one of the most sensible pieces of literature on the multilateral of the future and the need to reshape multilateralism. And one of the striking points of this report is that it comes from a perspective that is not disruptive, but basically sees the evolution of the multilateral system with the UN at its core, but needing serious reshaping and serious changes to be able to embrace and confront the global challenges that are here. They're not at the doorstep, they're basically now inside the room. So Adam, Thank you for making time. Thank you for being back with us today. Thanks, Francesco, and happy birthday to you. Hey, thanks. So lovely. Let's dive in. In this uh, part one of this episode, we're going to look at the first three shifts. As I said, there are six shifts, and the first three are rebuild trust in multilateralism. Number two is planet and people, and number three is global finance. So before we dive in, would you like to just remind the audience how these shifts are, you know, embedded in the report and how the report is nested in this logic that is taking us to the summit of the future? Yeah, thanks, Francesco. I think that's a great starting point. And really, this report by the High Level Advisory Board is one of the initiatives that the Secretary General started in his common agenda of a few years ago now. And one way to think about it is the, his common agenda report was a response to a request by the General Assembly to come up with ways of improving the UN system to respond to today's and tomorrow's threats. And so the common agenda report has between 80 and 90 recommendations in it, lots of initiatives, some of which have already happened. And one of the initiatives was the Secretary General formed this independent body to come up with some of these answers around improving multilateralism. So the framework really is the SG wanted a group of independent experts to come up with bold but practical ideas to, to take forward some of those ideas in the common agenda. And so the six shifts were really the six areas that the Secretary General thought were the most important areas for global governance in the UN system to take up. And there are other ones that um, you may see are not in there enough. And one of the ideas there is the High Level Advisory Board was trying to fill a gap in the discussion. And so you might see some of the other areas, like for example, the Global Digital Compact is a separate process. And so in some areas, the board was seeing itself as complementary to something. And in other areas, it was seeing itself as really pushing forward into new ground. So you, some of the areas in shift one about representing different actors in the multilateral system, nobody else is really talking about that in a formal process. So I think there's a mix of initiatives and ideas in this report that's useful to kind of think about as separate ideas and, and proposals. Okay, so with that premise, let's dive in. Tell us about shift one, rebuild trust in multilateralism. Yeah, so shift one is not a substantive topic per se. It's more about how multilateralism is done, how different actors are brought in. One of the innovations of, of that section actually is it's got 10 principles that should guide effective multilateralism about being more people-centered and equitable. But I think getting into the more kind of direct proposals, there are a few that are worth flagging. One is the one that probably the listeners are very well aware of, which is about the need to improve the ability of civil society and non-state actors to, to play a meaningful role in multilateralism rather than just a kind of peripheral one. I, I think that's pretty well known, and I would say that the HLAB report is more of a kind of consolidation of the, the ideas that are already out there around civil society. But then there are some other ones. One proposal is to grant formal status to cities and subnational governments in 
some multilateral processes. And that's really a reflection of how important cities are in much of multilateralism today. So, for example, most of the action on the environment that we see today is actually being led by mayors and cities. And there's a mayor's network that a lot of people are aware of. And so I think giving a formal status to cities and subnational governments would be an important reflection of how important they are and also a way to generate maybe more meaningful action in areas that have gotten stuck. Similarly, um, there's a recommendation for including the private sector and corporations and industry in some multilateral processes. The best example of that, Inger Anderson, the head of UNEP, is overseeing a, a treaty process right now that involves plastics and pollution. And she has, and the process has actually included some of the major industrial players in it formally. What that means is they're going to be obligated by the outcome of that process. And I think that's very important in two areas, the environment where industry and big oil and, and, and other actors can be seen as spoilers, but can also be seen as necessary parties to any obligations. And then also tech and AI governance. You can't do a, a treaty or any kind of regulation of AI without involving the private sector directly. And so I think the High Level Advisory Board really saw that those two sets of actors, subnational governments and private sector, were much more integral to multilateralism than, than has been given credit in the system. And then maybe just two other quick points on that first shift. One is there's a big hole in who is represented in multilateralism. And that hole is people who haven't been born yet. And this idea of finding ways to represent future generations in multilateralism is extremely important. If you think about even just the framing of the, the report, it talks about for today and, the, and tomorrow, for the present and the future, you've got a summit of the future coming up. I think one of the big questions is how do you design an architecture today that accounts for the needs? And I think the important word that High Level Advisory Board uses is rights, the rights of future generations in actions today. And the SG, by the way, has done really interesting proposals. So his policy brief on moving beyond GDP, finding other measures of progress, you could envision that uh, a measure of progress that also took into account potential harm against future generations would actually radically change how we think about progress today. So I think we can get much more into detail, but I think that core question of how to represent future generations today is, is probably one of the most fundamental ones. And then the final part about shift one that's worth um, flagging is so many of multilateral processes today are stuck around this notion of consensus as needing unanimity. So what that means is if you're in a multilateral uh, process around nuclear weapons, one member state can block an initiative. Now, the plain meaning of consensus is not unanimity. The plain meaning of consensus is most people most of the time. And I think what the high-level advisory board saw was the need on certain processes that are very stuck to start transitioning into a different way of thinking about consensus where most people most of the time agree that we need to denuclearize. Most people most of the time agree that we need to shift off of fossil fuels. How can we have the system reflect that notion of consensus as a majority? That's quite a radical idea too. And we can talk about how likely it is for any of those to land. But I think those are the major themes from shift one that I, I think are worth highlighting. I think what comes out of your description of shift one is this, you know, centrality of uh, making multilateralism inclusive, the link to future generations and rethinking consensus. So, well, thank you for that. There are very powerful ideas. The likelihood of those landing in the proper way, it also depends on how deep is the understanding of the various parties of what multilateralism should be for us to be able to confront all these challenges. So that may change with time. Maybe it requires a higher degree of wisdom than the one that we have now, but at least we have a, a view in the right direction. So shift to now, planet and people, and this is about regaining balance with nature and provide clean energy for all. I'm quoting from the report subtitle. So yeah, over to you. Let's talk about shift two. The starting point for shift two is also that environmental governance and the, the triple planetary crisis of climate change, biodiversity loss and pollution is something that there are other forums for dealing with that. You've got the UN Environmental Assembly, you've got the UNFCCC, but I think that the High Level Advisory Board saw the need to bring this all together and make it much more central to what multilateralism is all about. 
if you think about, and we come to this at the end, but if you think about the three pillars of the UN, it's peace and security, development, and human rights. There isn't an environmental pillar. Environment is often subordinated to development. And I think part of the goal of the board here was really to say, this is much more central to the work of global governance, multilateralism. Um, is dealing with the environment. It not only cuts across all of these other areas, but it's really probably the biggest challenge of our time. And so there are really four clusters of recommendations that the board made. The first one is that we need a much higher level of ambition around our various goals around decarbonization, ending the fossil fuel industry, net zero emissions, net zero biodiversity loss. And the term pact for people and planet is controversial in some circles. There have been attempts in the past to create a legally binding environmental kind of omnibus um, agreement. But I think the underlying idea, and you can actually see this in the annex to the report, only two annexes in the report, where they really detail what would need to be the very specific commitments that member states and others took to essentially stay below 1.5 and to start reaching something closer to a circular economy. Now, some of those, uh, many of those goals are already present in existing treaties. And so I think the idea of the board was, let's not reinvent those treaties. There's a risk always in reopening these things, but let's re at least have a political commitment to elevating the ambition a little bit higher. I think especially now that COP28 is behind us and you see some progress, but really that phase out of fossil fuels is we're not there yet. I think that's one of the core messages from the board is we need to get there. The second one is a decarbonization package. And I think the decarbonization package is one of the kind of mechanisms that the board sees, we're in an era where it's very difficult to reach legally binding agreements at the multilateral level, very difficult to reach a treaty that would cover decarbonization, for example, or a, a fossil fuel ban is another idea that was put out there. So the board was thinking kind of behavioral science terms about how to create incentives for investing outside of fossil fuels. So the decarbonization package is really a set of ways of pricing regulating and disincentivizing carbon-based energy. In a similar way, the easiest way to understand this is what, what President Biden did in the U.S. with the Inflation Reduction Act was to create a large investment in renewable energy and to try and shift the calculus. This is essentially, shorthand, an IRA for the planet. It would be a large-scale shift in how you position resources towards renewables. And to complement that really is the third set of ideas the board had, which is a change in trade and intellectual property to really incentivize green investment. There's a great initiative, by the way, that the WTO is doing right now um, called the Villars Framework, which is all about shifting the trade system towards sustainability. But also if you imagine if a big Western country has a renewable technology like a way to produce hydrogen or a, a small nuclear energy, one of the key barriers to that becoming cost effective in the global south is IP, intellectual property. If you could create a certain sense that certain environmental technologies were needed to be eased in terms of intellectual property and a set of incentives around that, you could imagine that technology moving much more quickly around the world. And then the fourth is a bit more structural. And this comes back to the first point, which is the environment needs to be much more elevated in the system. And the fourth set of recommendations is about elevating the environment, empowering and capacitating the UN environmental program to deal with the, the environmental crisis that we're in right now. Right now, UNEP, as it's called, the UN Environmental Program, is quite small. Um, it doesn't have a huge number of capacities. It doesn't occupy a pillar in the UN like human rights or development does. And so really the board saw a set of increasing capacities. For example, just like we have here in Geneva, the Human Rights Council has a set of rapporteurs to investigate human rights violations. UNEP could have a set of special rapporteurs and capacities to investigate environmental violations. Now that we've got the human right to a clean, healthy, sustainable environment, we have a nice legal hook for that. You could also imagine that UNEP could have a better capacity to track in a live way um, the various violations of environmental rights, but also the various kind of thresholds that we can cross. So if you think about the nine planetary boundaries that Johan Rockström and others have articulated, you could imagine that UNEP could have a consolidated kind of large data capacity to track our various environmental thresholds around biodiversity loss, pollution, climate change, aerosols, all the things that are kind of interacting globally. But right now what we have is kind of siloed capacities to track them. 
and a lot of other capacities that could go that could improve UNEP's ability to really be something like a global environmental agency rather than a program. And I think that term agency gets us much more into the realm of thinking of the environment as a fourth pillar of the UN rather than as something that is kind of below that level. So I think that's really the cluster of recommendations around the environment. I do want to note at the end of this that there is no environmental track or pillar in the lead up to the summit of the future. And for me, that's a a big worry. There is no natural landing place for these recommendations in the summit, uh, which I think makes it even more important that we figure out other ways of landing some of these ideas, including possibly in the context of the summit, even without a dedicated kind of discussion on it right now. And before we move to shift three, I think um, let's stay here for a couple of minutes. It's quite worrying, as you say. The board who wrote the report that we're dealing with in this episode saw this need. And this shift number two highlights also the need or the possibility, the option to elevate environment to, if not a fourth pillar for the UN, but at least the status of fundamental areas of concern and action. How is it that there's no landing space for this in what we know today about the um, drafting process of the pact of the future that is basically the product that is foreseen out of the summit itself? Yeah, I think there are a couple answers to that question. One is just to remind listeners that this is a member state-led pact for the future process and summit of the future. So this isn't a decision that, you know, the Secretary General took about what's there and what's not there. But I think the proponents of the approach that's been taken say that there are other formal agreed forums for dealing with these issues. So if you're going to talk about climate change, you've got the COPs and you just had COP28, you've got COP16 coming up later this year in Brazil to deal with biodiversity. And they say those are the places where these environmental issues need to be dealt with. The UN Environmental Assembly at the end of February is another formal place where member states come together. There is the possibility, by the way, that the UN Environmental Assembly does take up some of these ideas. And actually, Stefan Levan and Donald Kabaruka, two members of the High-Level Advisory Board, briefed the permanent representatives at UNEA in their preparatory session last fall about these recommendations about elevating the environment, and there may be some uptake. So I think the proponents of not having the summit of the future deal directly with the environment um, would say it's because we had these other four. I still think that to have a summit that's called the summit of the future not have a dedicated outcome on the environment is a strategic mistake. It will mean that the summit would not resonate with the enormous majority of young people in particular who think of this as the number one issue. Certainly I do. And so I do think there's space, even now as the pact has been largely negotiated, to work some of these ideas in. There is a pillar, for example, on sustainable development where you know there are five or six SDGs that refer to the environment. There's the preamble. Certainly the pillar on future generations. There is a pillar on future generations. We could very easily say that the most important issue to secure for future generations is a sustainable environment. So I could imagine there are still opportunities to get a deliverable out of the summit on the environment, even though I feel that the structure and the architecture of the process so far has constrained a kind of dedicated discussion of it so far. Right. And all of that doesn't take away from the importance of shift two in itself. And of course, if shift one were operated 90 to 100 percent, then some of shift two would be dragged into, set into motion by that, of course, because all these are, of course, interlinked. So let's take a look then at shift three, which is about global finance and ensuring sustainable finance that delivers for all, no less. So shift three... I think the starting point really is that when the Secretary General first announced this high-level advisory board, it had a different title. It was called the High-Level Advisory Board on Global Public Goods. And the idea there is really that there are certain issues that are of such global and common concern that they need to be treated as something that you don't compete over and that you don't exclude others from. That's the kind of traditional economic definition of a global public good. A good example of a global public good is the Civil Aviation Authority. It's the rules around which we all fly planes and everybody agrees to them. We all benefit from them in the same way we all benefit from a traffic light. We don't exclude people from a traffic light. We all use it and benefit from it. And I think the idea that the Secretary General had in mind there, and you can even look on page 50 of the Common Agenda Report, there's a little diagram that shows what should be considered a global public good. It's remarkable what's in that circle. You've got peace, 
but you've also got the environment is in there. You've got digital space in there. And so I think the starting point for the global financial discussion that the High Level Advisory Board had was we need to reorient the multilateral development banking system to be more about delivering global public goods and less about post-World War II reconstruction, which is really how the World Bank and the IMF were set up. And so I think that's the real starting point. And so if you look at the recommendations in the High Level Advisory Board report, that's the starting point. They say we need to repurpose the multilateral development banking system around global public goods. And they suggest what some of those could be. They're not trying to give all the answers, but they say that they should be identified. And I think that's really important. You could imagine a really transformative uh, moment if you thought of peace as a global public good then all of the investments that you do that tend towards militarization and war would actually be against the grain of that understanding. And you'd have to think about demilitarization and investment in peace positive outcomes. By the way, Interpeace here in Geneva has a great set of recommendations called Financing for Peace, which, which really treats peace as a global public good. And so I think there are a lot of ideas that you can get out of that starting point. I think the other starting point for this particular recommendation is that there are a lot of initiatives already underway. So, for example, Mia Motley's Bridgetown Initiative is an extremely important, high-profile, financial side set of recommendations that's very meaningful to the Global South. In my view, it could be essentially the platform on which Mia Motley runs for Secretary General, by the way. I mean, it's that, that important. So I think what the board was trying to do was acknowledge that there are these ideas out there and to create a kind of coherent vehicle. So the starting point is this idea of global public goods. And the second step that they propose is strengthening of the global financial safety net. So the idea here is that especially unstable or chronically poor regions tend to get caught in this negative cycle of getting worse deals on access to financial resources, higher interest rates, much more difficult access to special drawing rights. In fact, special drawing rights seems to just pay back developed countries fairly quickly and not developing ones. And so getting better access to that kind of funding, more regular issuance of things like special drawing rights, we don't need to get into the details, but to essentially create a field where developing countries, where conflict-affected countries are not treated as second-class citizens in the financial architecture is a really important step. And by the way, you see that same initiative in COP28. There's a very important aspect of COP28, which essentially said conflict-affected countries should not have less access to climate adaptation funding than stable ones, which is the case up until now. So very important, I think. And I think this really captures the zeitgeist of right now, which is a very strong push by the global south to stop having a financial system that has multiple tiers where, where developing countries are treated worse in many respects. And so I think that idea of a financial safety net is very important. I think it also reflects a sense that the global financial system needs to stop being just a kind of recycling of funds amongst the wealthy countries. A third one, which is quite interesting, and, and here I think very much out of the hands of the UN, the, the high level would propose a set of changes to the governance structures and decision-making of actors like the World Bank. Right now, the World Bank is essentially dominated by the US, not only in terms of its board, but also the decision-making. And that really isn't a reflection of the countries that have the most interest in the work of the World Bank. So there are changes to the, the governance structures, the representation on those bodies that were proposed by the board. And I think one of the key other issues that's related to more equitable treatment is a strengthening of the global debt treatment process. Right now, debt is something that's very opaque, that creates vicious cycles for highly indebted countries. And so creating better safeguards for developing countries and better debt transparency, the board really saw was also a way to kind of free the system from these negative cycles. They did hint at some potential taxation reforms, which would be a quite controversial issue. I don't think they went very far in that realm, in part because it's difficult to balance high ambition with reality in some of these. And I think you get a sense around kind of global taxation reforms. It may be a step that extends beyond where we are right now, though a very important one. And I think this is probably the shift where the board had the greatest expertise. Uh, people like Jayati Ghosh and Donald Kaparuka and Tharman, um, who's now the president of Singapore. I mean, this is a group of people that really know their stuff. Um, and so I think what's nice about Shift 3 is that it finds a viable but yet ambitious track for financial. One of the issues, though, just to close on this shift really, is that even though there is a policy brief by the Secretary General on international financial institutions, a very good one, by the way, which largely aligns with HLAB, even though there are things like Mia Motley's Bridgetown Initiative, like this board report, even though there's a track that could cover this 
in the summit of the future, most of the action on this is going to happen outside of the formal UN system, even though the bank is more or less the UN, it's treated differently. And so I think one of the challenges with all of these ideas is where's your entry point? Where's your theory of change and influence? And that question is very much open right now. Well, thank you so much. We went over these first three shifts and in the part two of this episode, We'll explore further uh, shift four, digital and data governance, shift five, peace and prevention, and six, anticipatory action. So for our audience, there will be the link to the entire report if you're interested in the notes to this podcast episode. And we'll see you in part two for the rest of the deep dive into the shift. So thank you, Adam, and we'll see you next time in the studio. Thanks, Francesco. Thanks, Francesco.